This Once conference will now be recorded. Once upon a time, I began mediating as a litigant, and I went to many mediations, and I got a lot of impasses, and I didn't really understand why I was getting the impasses. Um, I would sit there, to, uh, I was usually a defense attorney, and I would sit there talking to the plaintiff. It's the only time you have to uh, talk directly to a plaintiff, and I would tell the plaintiff what a terrible case they had, and how we're going to win, and they have terrible facts. And I didn't understand at that time the uh, neuroscience or the neuropsychology of negotiation, which I learned a lot later. I didn't understand the um, importance of how the neuroscience and the brain releasing dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter, and how that works with the prefrontal cortex of the brain, which is the decision-making process. I didn't know about decisional errors and how uh, attorneys made decisional errors on both sides of the table. And I didn't know about who was the better guesser, meaning um, who gets better as to whether or not to leave the money on the table or to go to trial and hopefully get a better result. And I didn't know the consequences of those decisions, which I now know as a litigant and as a mediator. And sometimes as a mediator, I have to explain that to other uh, people in the room who are the participants of the mediation. Next slide, please. There are, there are many ways to solve disputes, as we know. Next slide. If we flip the coin in the air, and if I would ask all you, what are the possibilities or probabilities of when the coin lands, uh, what would it be? And most of you say it would be two, heads or tails. Uh, but that's wrong. There are three possibilities. Next slide. Uh, the third possibility, of course, is a one in a million. It could land on the edge. And that's a surprise. Uh, and that goes into the theme later on as why attorneys uh, do not make good negotiators because um, uh, they're caught with surprises that should not be a surprise to them. Uh, next slide, please. So let's uh, begin with the mediation IQ. Preparing for mediation takes as much thought and analysis as preparing for trial. The answer, of course, is true. Next. Experienced lawyers generally make fewer mistakes in mediation than young lawyers. And the answer is false. Uh, experienced lawyers may make terrible mistakes and terrible decisional errors, and we'll go over that later on. Next, please. Lawyers, lawyers must zealously advocate a client's interest in mediation. And the answer is false. Uh, zealously advocating a client's interest is reserved for trials. Uh, when you go to mediation, you leave your trial skills outside the door. Next, please. Preparing a concession plan, and we'll go over that later in advance, is unnecessary for experienced negotiators. And the answer is false. Next. Emotions play a, a large role in every legal negotiation. And the answer is true, and you have to get through the emotions before you can get, get down to uh, serious negotiations. Next, please. Lawyers are good at assessing uncertainty, risk, and trial outcomes. And the answer is patently false. They're terrible at assessing risks and trial outcomes in mediations. Next. The strategic mediation advocate starts high or low as possible to make room for concessions. And the answer 
This is not an easy answer because there's some science out there that if plaintiff's attorneys start higher than the case is worth, the case will settle at a higher value. So it depends on the circumstance and it depends on the attorneys. Next. Bidding against yourself is a mistake. The answer is false. Sometimes as a mediator, one side doesn't want to move. And I go into the caucus room. I say, you know, they're not moving. They want you to come up or they want you to come down. And the answer I usually get as a mediator, well, that's bidding against myself. And my response to that is, so what? If it keeps the negotiations going, you do it. Next, bargaining in bad faith means the other side's offers or demands are unrealistic, and that's false. Uh, there really is no bad faith uh, negotiation. You don't have to show up with anything. You have to show up uh, with authority to settle the case, and if that authority is a dollar, it's, it's a dollar. Next, please. Most lawyers know how to avoid the effects of decisional errors caused by cognitive biases. And the answer is false. Uh, they don't know how to avoid decisional errors and we're gonna get, get into that later. Next, please. So the question is, why are you here at mediation? And the answer sometimes we get, the judge forced me to, I can't go to trial without mediation. I came here to get an impasse. I came here to see where the other side's case is about, which you'll never see the entire thing. And what I wanna hear is I came here to settle the case. And you know pretty fast by what the initial demand or offer is if they really came here to settle the case. Next, please. We're gonna get into decisional errors. Uh, this occurs when either a plaintiff or a defendant decides to reject the adversary's settlement offer, proceeds to trial, finds out that the results at the trial is financially the same or worse than the rejected settlement offer. I call this the oops phenomenon, uh, meaning um, uh, this result was not expected. I've got to make some phone calls and I'm not looking forward to calling the client to tell them uh, what the result is. Next, please. Uh, we have various studies, and I'm not gonna go uh, before the Kaiser study because the Kaiser study is the most recent study. They examined 4,500 cases, 9,000 settlement decisions, and they found that 61% of the plaintiffs and 24% of defendants obtained an award at trial that was the same as or worse than the results they could have achieved by accepting pretrial settlement proposals or mediation offers or uh, demands. Um, the science initially was that the plaintiff's attorney and defense attorney were equally uh, uh, talented and uh, it was basically a 50-50 coin to us. But as the scientific studies came out, they determined that the plaintiff's attorney uh, was the worst of the guessers and the defendant's attorney was the better of the guessers as to whether or not to take the money on the table um, or go to trial. And we're gonna see the consequences of that. Next, please. Um, Kaiser's expanded findings in 2013, which is the update, is although the defendants were better guesses than plaintiff's attorneys, the plaintiff's attorneys who uh, decided to be cavalier and go to trial usually got a verdict of $75,000 less than they, would, than they could have done in mediation. And in a lot of cases, defendants who were the better guesses uh, usually got verdicts of about $1.4 million more than they, what, they, what they could have done in mediation. Next, please. Uh, 
so the examination was made of attorneys who served as mediators. Uh, so if you have an attorney who served as mediators, they had lower incidences of decisional errors because they were trained better, they knew better, they studied better, and perhaps they um, came across as some of these science uh, uh, studies. Next, please. Now, in the high-end cases, uh, it gets a little more dangerous. Uh, attorneys are presumed to be more experienced and sophisticated in high-end cases, but they're not. When the demand is between a million and $50 million, the incidence of the plaintiff's error was 58% compared to 28% for the defendant, but the consequences of that were horrendous. The cost of the plaintiff's error was about $327,000 less that they could have done in mediation. And the, uh, the cost of the defendant's error was about $5 million more or higher than, than what they could have done in mediation. And this is, uh, these, these are just not numbers that are pulled out of the air. These are uh, scientific scientists who have studied this and studied the results, and these results are published in papers. And if you if you want the papers, I'll be more than happy to send you the Kaiser papers. There are two Kaiser papers. One is pretty long, and one is pretty short. Just uh, write to me, call me, and I'll send them. Next, please. So lawyers are lousy decision makers. Uh, they don't know it, but the uh, science uh, bears that out. Next, please. Uh, plaintiffs are wrong 50% of the time. Next. For an average error factor of about $75,000 less than what they could have done in mediation. Next. Defense attorneys are only wrong 25% of the time. Next. But the consequences are, you know, they get a result of about $1.4 million more than what they could have done in mediation. Next. Next. So what's going on here? Um, I made a chart of the decision-making process. I broke it down to system one thinking and system two thinking. Uh, the job of the mediator is to get the attorneys out of system one thinking and into system two thinking. System one thinking is effortless, impulsive, intuitive, automatic, pre-conscious, less energy, it's emotional. Uh, system two thinking, uh, you're not going to get a, a good result until you get the attorneys out of system one thinking. It requires effort. It's painful. It resists impulsivity. It's cautious, conservative. It's conscious and rational. And you have to get them into the system two thinking. Uh, we have mirror neurons. What are mirror neurons? And when you go over to a, um, a child or a baby and you smile, they're going to smile back. You walk into a mediation room as a mediator, you smile, and hopefully you're going to get a smile back. Uh, it, it's a mirror. These are neurons in our body that uh, account for this. Next, please. So the neuroscience of decision-making. You have to have some working knowledge either as a litigant in mediation or a mediator, the interaction between dopamine and the prefrontal cortex of the brain. Next. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter which the brain emits. It's a happy drug. Uh, a plaintiff uh, going into mediation, uh, the brain releases dopamine. Uh, the attorney says we're going to get a great result, and uh, they're very happy. Uh, next, please. 
then in comes the defense attorney, or in the early days, in comes Wexler and tells the plaintiff uh, they have a terrible case, they're going to lose, and here's why they're going to lose, and it's going to be expensive for them, they're going to pay costs, etc. And what I have done and why I didn't get good results and why I got a lot of impasses, I would shut down the prefrontal cortex of the plaintiff's brain. And once you do that, you might as well go home uh, because they're not going to listen to anything more than you say. So there are ways to, for either, either side, it's not just the defense side, but the plaintiff side also, to make opening statements, uh, being aware that you're not going to shut down the prefrontal cortex of the brain. So let's get into some of the things that uh, litigants need to do to prepare for a good mediation. Next, please. Understand your client's real needs. And the next 10 slides, probably most attorneys don't don't get it. They don't understand the client's real needs. Uh, they, um, uh, they don't know what a client needs for a rainy day. And uh, they don't know what the long-term care is and they haven't done their homework. Next, please. Do a thorough damage analysis. Most attorneys don't do it. Uh, be realistic, understand the damages, understand the economics, uh, talk it over with others. Uh, that's, that becomes very important, and we're going to get to that later. And uh, a lot of attorneys on both sides walk into mediations without talking it over with their boss, with their colleagues, uh, with the staff, with uh, their significant other outside of the legal process. And they don't do that. Next, please. Verdict uh, research. It's easy. There are plenty of tools online. Uh, you can research similar verdicts. You can uh, research similar settlements. And if you really want to become sophisticated, um, go on the website called Picture It Settled. Um, it's an amazing tool. It's based on science, and the person who wrote this uh, will tell you that after three moves in a settlement negotiation, in mediation, uh, they will tell you, or the software will tell you, where the case is going to settle. So just imagine the advantage that a person has that after three moves, at three moves, that's all it is. They're going to know where the case is going to settle. Next, please. Do a non-monetary cost assessment. This is really got done. Um, what if I lose? Uh, how is this going to affect my business? Uh, and I always tell litigants, they're not in the business of litigation. Uh, we attorneys, we mediators, uh, we're in the business of the legal process. We're, we're comfortable in the mediation room. We're comfortable in the, uh, the courtroom. Uh, litigants aren't. Next, please. And it's not rocket science. Uh, do a litigation budget. Um, what are the attorney's fees going to be? Do a realistic cost assessment. Uh, discuss with the client. Prepare a realistic budget. What is this going to cost if we don't settle this case in mediation? And I always tell people that mediation is the, uh, you are the author of your own fate. What that means is I tell them that you have the opportunity today to write the last chapter of the book. Uh, the last chapter of the book is the settlement. If we don't write the last chapter of the book, you give this case over to six strangers who don't know you, never saw you, never will see you again. They will write the last chapter of the book. 
And if you're comfortable doing that, and the people come from driver's licenses, um, give it over to them. But you have now relinquished your control over the outcome of the case. Next. Do an expected value analysis. Now, this is a great tool for mediators, a great tool for litigants. Um, I don't use it early on as a mediator, but what it basically does is I take a piece of paper on the left-hand side, I write down um, what the, uh, the chance of winning is, and it has to add up to 100%. And I tell them to pick a low, medium, and high. And then next to each one, I tell them to uh, pick a low, medium, and high verdict. Uh, low verdict, high verdict, uh, runaway verdict, doesn't matter. And then I multiply the percent by the uh, uh, the number, and I come up with a figure, and I add it all up, and I come up with a number, and that number basically tells me that out of 100 cases that are tried, that will be the average verdict. But you can't stop there. You have to go and do a... Um, expected value analysis the way the other thought the other side thinks and then you average them both together and uh, it's a valuable tool I use later on in the mediation when things aren't going well and sometimes uh, the parties really see this and they see that their demands or their offers are way off next please Do a concession paddle pattern modeling. Uh, like the flip of the coin in the beginning, there were no surprises. I always hear as a mediator, uh, I'm surprised. I say, what are you surprised about? I'm surprised of the offer. I'm surprised at the demand. I said, how long have you been doing this? You've been doing this a long time. Why should you be surprised? There were no, no surprises in mediation. You should have a plan or you should know what your next move is, regardless of how ridiculous the offer or the demand is. So you should do this in advance and do a concession pattern modeling. Next. Hidden agendas. Uh, have you looked at them? Has the attorney looked at them? What is the risk to the client? Uh, what jurisdiction are you in? What is the jury makeup? Who's the judge? Uh, I don't think I ever tried a case, and I've handled hundreds and hundreds of cases, um, where there wasn't some surprise to me from some witness. So there's a certain amount of uncertainty of witnesses. So you have to um, uh, examine all these, which I call hidden agenda. Next. Talk it over with your client or your boss. Um, I have cases that uh, I have a hard time evaluating. And, you know, I grew up as a defense attorney representing corporate America and mainly catastrophic cases. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's good to go walk down the hallway, talk it over with other attorneys. But I usually bypass that. I talk it up with the staff. I go into the IT room. I go to the copy room. I go home. I talk to friends. I talk to people who are not uh, connected to the legal business and ask their opinion. What do you think of this case? Uh, you, you'd be surprised. Next, please. Prepare a written negotiation strategy. Um, and very few attorneys do this. Uh, what is the strategy when you walk into the room? Uh, what are you going to do with office? And what are you going to do with demands? And write it down and prepare it and understand it. And uh, don't leave that out. So... I call that the, uh, the 10 essential steps that you need to be an effective negotiator. 
uh, be it a defense uh, on the defense side or on the plaintiff side. Uh, let's get into some of the ethics. Next, please. So these are basic and maybe not so basic. Uh, when does the mediation begin? Well, the mediation begins when the judge signs the order sending you to mediation. Uh, what's the role of the mediator? Uh, the only thing the mediator is re required to say in an opening statement, and I keep my opening statement down to five minutes or less, because it's not about me. Uh, the only thing we're required to say is everything that's said here is confidential unless permitted or required by law. Nobody's ever asked me what that means. Uh, I think we, most of us know what it means. If, if we determine there's been abuse of the elderly or the vulnerable, uh, we may be permitted or required to report those things. Uh, many times I'm asked about the law. We, we, we don't uh, give opinions on the law. Uh, do I know the value of the case? I know the value of every single case that is presented to me because I spent years and years of um, telling my clients when they call, they want two things. What's the value of the case and what's our chance of winning? And I hate those two questions, but you know, I have a lot of experience in doing that, but we don't, we don't talk about the value of the case in mediation. Um, what uh, if the mediation is asked if they should take the money on the table? That's, that's not for us to decide. That's for the, uh, the other side to the side. So those are the, um, the high points in um, mediation. Uh, I've studied with some uh, extraordinary teachers, uh, national teachers who went into the science of it, who went into the neuroscience and the neural psychology and, and explained how negotiations work and why uh, attorneys do not make good decisions in mediation, which, and if the mediator knows this going into the mediation, you're armed with tremendous amount of tools and knowledge to get people back on the track. The second subject uh, I'm going to get into, next slide, please, is the admissibility of the electronically stored information. I started uh, becoming a student of ESI or eDiscovery many, many years ago. I joined what was called the Sedona Conference, which is the uh, think tank of ESI. Uh, I've been appointed. Uh, several times as a special master to help the parties through difficult things. Uh, they get caught up in a whole lot of uh, things. Next slide. There's a, um, an expert out there, Craig Ball. Uh, you can look him up. He's got a great website, great articles. Uh, the reality of electronic discovery is it starts as the responsibility of those who don't understand the technology and it ends up the responsibility of those who don't understand the law. And most attorneys don't understand the law. They come running into the judge. I want uh, sanctions. I want an adverse jury instruction. I want the pleading stricken. Uh, I want to use um, uh, computers for search terms. Uh, and they really haven't done their homework. They haven't studied it. They don't know the cases. They don't know the law. They don't know the rules. And it's up to us if we're going to be a, and I'll talk about this later, I'm going to try to get the judges to uh, sign on to what's called e-mediation. In other words, uh, select uh, somebody who knows e-discovery send the case to uh, mediation only to resolve the e-discovery disputes. It's, it's a lot of you articles on it. Be glad to send it to you. Uh, it's a great tool. Next. This is, and I love it. This, this is the, uh, the, uh, the one minute internet, uh, what happens in one minute. 
uh, if you take a look at 218 versus 219, uh, the amount of searches, the amount of uh, uh, Instagrams, the the amount of uh, Google searches, Facebooks uh, rose a little. But if you take a look at this, it's it's really amazing that we are in the internet world and what happens in 60 seconds. Uh, it, it's just it's mind blowing. Um, and then we get into the admissibility of some of this, or all of it. And the admissibility of e-discovery is no different. Uh, and I, and I, when I teach it, and when I put it on seminars, you know, I tell people it's no different than introducing a piece of paper or a photograph. Uh, let's go to the next uh, slide. Uh, Lorraine versus Markel Insurance Company. Uh, it was a very interesting case. Uh, it was an arbitration. It had to do with the lightning striking a boat, causing uh, damage, and the uh, the arbitrator came up with an award of fourteen thousand dollars, and um, uh, they appealed it. Although there are very little rights to appeal in mediation. And the reason I bring this uh, case to your attention is it sets forth the uh, requirements that you need to introduce ESI into evidence. Uh, I don't want to call this the seminal case. The seminal case started in 2003 in the famous Zubalake, Z-U-B-U-L-A-K-E, by Judge Shira Scheinling from the... Um, uh, Southern District of New York, she wrote about five or six opinions, and those were the seminal opinions. So if you're going to get involved in any discovery, you, you have to start back in the Zule cases, and each one is scarier than the other because the, the sanctions at the end were just horrible. Uh, next slide, please. And in the Lorraine case, um, the court said, failure of counsel collectively to establish the authenticity of their exhibits, resolve potential hearsay issues, comply with original writing rule, demonstrate the absence of unfair prejudice, rendered their exhibits inadmissible, resulting in the dismissal without prejudice of their cross motions and summary judgments. So here the court is laying out some of the tests that you need or some of the things that you need to get your ESI into evidence. Next. So the uh, Lorraine test is, is it relevant under Rule 401? Next. Is it authentic under 901? Next. And it's a hearsay under 801 and, and 803 and 807 and other rules. So relevance, authenticity, and hearsay become the factors in introducing any type of uh, evidence, especially ESI. Next, please. Um, and then the court goes on to say, is the form of ESI that is being offered as evidence an original or duplicate under the original writing rule. So now that you have the original writing rule that comes into effect. Next. Uh, is it unfair prejudice? You know, I would always uh, hear attorneys get up in trial and say, I object, it's prejudicial. Every piece of evidence against you is prejudicial. And, and the key is, it, is it unfair prejudice? Uh, unfair is the key. Next. We get involved in social media. Uh, 2019 survey, 72% of the workers on the job access social media at least one time a day, and the majority do it several times a day. And 28% of the employees spend at least one hour on social networking sites a day. This becomes important if you have to uh, uh, 
uh, capture, you know, what the social media on a company's computer is or a person's laptop or cell phone. Next. Uh, mistakes I've made. Next. Uh, digital evidence may not be easy to get into evidence as you may think. You just can't show a judge and, and some people have done it. They, they take out their cell phone and they say, judge, look at the cell phone, look at the I am. <laughs> you can't do that. Judge is not going to allow that into evidence. You, you may know that your digital evidence and email is authentic, but the court demands a lot more than that. Uh, so you may need proof of, of authenticity, uh, witnesses, signature blocks, uh, email addresses, uh, have the party stipulate to it, uh, get over the hearsay uh, objection that you may have. Next. So if we take a look at the top admission mistakes made with ESI, uh, you assume the admission of social media is different from uh, other evidence. It's not. Next. Is it relevant? Is it hearsay? Is it reliable? Chain of custody becomes very important. Does it comply with the Florida Evidence Code? Is it authentic or trustworthy? and you should know what the proper objections are. Next, please. In 2015, the uh, new amendments to the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure were changed. You need to know them. Next. These are the um, important ones that were changed that covers ESI. Um, and I want to emphasize 37E, uh, which is the one that gives the court sanctions uh, authority to sanction people. If you have a duty to preserve and you didn't preserve it and it was intentional, the court has a lot of power to issue sanctions. And if you object, and say, well, you know, the sanctions you're being issued doesn't fall within 37E, the court will remind you of what's called inherent authority. I have inherent authority to do anything I want to do. I don't care if you don't like it in 37E. I have inherent authority. I'm going to do it anyhow. Uh, next. So... One of the changes is Rule 16, which is the scheduling of the management. It used to be uh, uh, 60 days. It's now uh, the early of 90 days or after the defendant has been served with a complaint or 60 days after the defendant. And in the pretrial conferences, you have to disclose your ESI. Uh, and if you don't disclose it, you may not be allowed to use it. Well, you may get sanctioned if you try to uh, use it. Next. And you have changes to uh, Rule 26, Conference of the Party, Planning for Discovery. Again, uh, this covers the electronically stored information. Next. So we know the case law is all over. It's as clear as mud. And uh, depending, you know, what jurisdiction you, you read, most of the cases on ESI are coming out of the federal courts, and they don't come out of the state courts for a lot of reasons. The judges don't have time, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the patience. So uh, the federal judges are the ones that are issuing the sanctions, and they know the ESI. Next. Um, Raleigh versus California, interesting case. Next. This was a case where uh, there was a traffic stop in California and they suspected that uh, this person uh, committed the crime. So they arrested him and took him to the police station and uh, took out, took away his cell phone. And of course, the cell phone had a pass on it and say, 
you know, I, I need the pass. And, and the, uh, the guy said, you're not getting the pass. So they broke into the cell phone. They saw his IM messages, put him at the scene of the crime. And he was convicted. This went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. Next. And the court said cell phones differ in both a quantitative and a qualitative sense from other objects that might be carried on a restless person. Uh, they have immense storage capacity these days. Um, uh, before cell phones, the search of a person was limited by physical realities and generally constituted only a narrow intrusion of privacy, but cell phones store millions of pages of text, thousands of pictures, hundreds of video, uh, and this has privacy consequences. Next. So the court, this is the United States Supreme Court, it says the cell phone collects everything in one place. Uh, the capacity uh, uh, is far more than previously possible. It can go back for years. More than 90% of American adults who own cell phones keep in, on their person a digital record of nearly every aspect of their lives. Next. Uh, the bottom line is from the United States Supreme Court, if you want to break into somebody's cell phone, get a warrant. And that's the only way you can do it. If you don't have a warrant and you're breaking in, you're not going to get it into evidence. Next. Griffin versus State, case that uh, MySpace was going back a ways, but it was not properly authenticated and uh, it was kept out. Next. The Donati case, the requirement of authentication and identification as a condition preceding to admissibility is satisfied by evidence sufficient to support a finding that the matter in question is what it is uh, purported or the, what the proponent claims it is. In other words, when you introduce ESI, is, is this really what uh, it really is, or is it something else? Next. So, how do you do it? Testimony of witnesses with knowledge, comparison with authenticated specimens. Next. Emails may be self-authenticated under rule, federal rule 907, 902, uh, parent seven. Next, I'm gonna go fast on some of these slides because we're running out of time. Um, we got Crispin, uh, go back to Crispin a second, one, one back. Uh, again, uh, the court held that uh, uh, you couldn't subpoena Facebook or MySpace uh, because of uh, what's called the Stored Communication Act. So you got to read the Stored Communication Act to see what you can subpoena. Uh, next. Uh, Yahoo is not subject to subpoena. Don't bother. You're wasting your time. Next. Green versus Bliss, uh, the court said uh, the sanctions were so egregious that it ordered the defendant party to provide a copy of the court's highly detailed opinion to every plaintiff in every lawsuit it had proceeding against it during two previous years. Next. Uh, you got Victor versus Stanley. They sent the attorney to jail, uh, not to exceed two years unless he pays the plaintiff's attorney fees and costs. That's what's going on in federal courts on ESI sanctions. Next. Uh, Facebook's legal position is they're not subject to civil subpoenas because it's precluded from disclosing the user content under the Stored Communication Act. 
but it now has a feature allowing users to download their information. Next, please. The Monterey case uh, basically stands for the preposition that anyone can create a fictitious account. So uh, just because it's uh, in an email doesn't mean the person prepared it themselves. Next. So the evidentiary rules are uh, relevance, authenticity, hearsay, original writings, and unfair prejudice. Next, please. Ethical considerations of counsel. Can an attorney advise a client to erase previous postings to social media? The answer is yes, but you better keep a hard copy of it. Otherwise, you may get sanctioned for destroying. Can an attorney advise a client to stop all postings to social media? Yeah. Next. Can an attorney advise a client to clean up future postings to social media? The answer is yes. Um, and that's it. And I thank you. And if anybody has any questions, um, let me know now or call me later on. If you need some information, if you need some cases, uh, I have a slideshow of a thousand slides on just about every topic on ESI. Uh, I would never show a thousand slides at one time, put somebody to sleep. Let's have a hard time sleeping, but I have a lot of cases and cases are coming out every single day on ESI and it's hard to keep up with all these cases, but I have most of the key cases. Um, so if you need any of these cases, or if you need some more information on mediation techniques, uh, I'll be glad to share them with you. Just holler, send me an email. Peter, why don't you announce your, uh, your email address for future reference? Sure, it's Peter, initial L is in Lawrence, Wexler, W-E-C-H-S-L-E-R at gmail.com. And my telephone is 305. 213-1222. Thank you. That, that's good. Um, now, just uh, we're going to be recording this uh, webinar, and also we have the slides. So um, anybody who needs some information, I saw where uh, Max Williams had asked me about <clears throat> getting copies of the slides. That's fine. Uh, we're also doing the recording which there'll be no charge uh, to download the recording in your SoundCloud account and once you set up an account on your Florida Academy uh, website. And if you have any issues with your uh, login, I re I'm the one who actually will reset the password. So if, uh, if anybody has any questions, they can shoot it at us now. If not, uh, I wanted to thank everybody for attending. And again, I will send out a notice when the um, when the recording is on the website. So if anybody wants to reference it, um, I'll also send everybody a note with uh, Peter's information and his uh, telephone number. And again, uh, thank you so much, Peter. Uh, I thought the webinar was very, very intriguing um, and very unusual. So we were always encourage our uh, members to present. It really is sharing. It's a good sharing mechanism. Plus it gets your name out there. And um, thanks again, Peter, and uh, we'll talk to everybody during the month. So, so long. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.